Alrighty class, moving on to chapter 3, the cellular level of organization. Now we're talking about cells. Before we go into cells, we'll talk about some fun facts. Always we'll add some kind of fun facts throughout the semester, throughout the slides, just to keep you engaged here. Humans shed and regrow outer skin cells about every 27 days, so it's a new you every 27 days. About 32 million bacteria call every inch of your skin home. Okay, and not all bacteria is bad. We need the bacteria. There's a lot of good bacteria. So if you're bathing in antibacterial soap all the time, that's not good either. Okay. The way that antibacterial soap work on viruses, because a lot of times people say, well, why are you using Purell for COVID-19? Well, I'll show you a nice little video uh, later and it'll... Uh, You'll actually, there is some um, justification of why you're using hand sanitizer for viruses. It disrupts the, the membrane, so we'll, we'll talk about that. 300 million cells die in the human body every minute, but get this, every day an adult body produces 300 billion new cells. In order to see cells, cells are very tiny, so we need some kind of instrument, and usually in labs you've used a microscope. More importantly, you've used a light microscope. Uh, those are portable, uh, more affordable than a transmission or a scanning electron microscope. But they're not cheap, so you still have to take care of them. And the light microscopes, visible light produces the image. It's the most often used by students. It's most limited magnification, only about 1200 X, so 1200 times the magnification, which is still a lot, but nothing compared to a transmission, which can do 600,000. Okay, it's most limited magnification and the ability for resolution, which is the ability to reveal detail. Now, there's no point you can magnify and magnify, but if you keep magnifying and it's still blurry, then it doesn't really matter. And that's the resolution. Okay, so resolution is how clear something is. A transmission electron microscope, TEM, has a better resolution. So you can see the proteins, nucleic acids. 600,000 and then scanning electron microscopes uses gold but you can only see the surface not the inside so here's um, images of red blood cells produced by three kinds of microscopes so this is the light microscope that you'll use here is the scanning and here's the transmission again the scanning you can only see the surface but the transmission you can go up to 600,000 times okay. this is a nice little image this is a florence stained cell undergoing mitosis and we'll talk about mitosis later this is a lung cell from a newt if you don't know what a newt is you'll have to take biology or zoology again commonly studied for its similarity to human lung cells is stained with fluorescent dyes the green stain reveals mitotic spindles Red is the cell membrane and part of the cytoplasm and structures that appear light blue are the chromosomes. So this cell is going in the anaphase. Okay, and we'll talk about the, the phases of mitosis later on in this lecture. Some cellular terminology, you have a basal surface, which is the lower surface, attaches to the basement membrane. You have an apical surface, which is the upper surface, and then you have a lateral surface. Micrometer is UM, okay, one millionth of a meter, 10 to the negative six. Now your eye, you can see 100 micrometers. And what is 100 micrometers? Well, the human egg. So females, you can actually visually see the egg with the naked eye. Now some of you, your eyes uh, are not that good. So you would have to have a pretty good eyesight, 20, 20, 15, 20, to be able to see that. If you wear glasses, maybe you could see it. But again, 100 micrometers is the smallest that humans can see with the naked eye. Naked eye meaning without the assistance of microscopes. Now, let's talk about some basic components of a cell. You have the plasma membrane, which is the surface boundary. I call the plasma membrane the bouncer, right? Before you need to go into a club or a restaurant or anything, there's usually some guy checking your ID or check and say, hey, or do you belong here? So the plasma membrane is like a bouncer. It's gonna check, say, hey, do you belong here? 
it's going to let sodium in, it's going to let sugar in, it's going to let water in. But if some kind of bacteria or virus come, then they're like, well, wait a second, you're not 21 yet. <laughs> That's my example. You're like, wait a second, let me check your ID. And if the ID doesn't match, then it doesn't allow it in. So the plasma membrane works the same way. If certain things come to the surface and say, whoa, let me check your credentials. And if it says, okay, sodium, potassium, chloride, uh, water, you're all, you can go in and out. No problem, no cover charge for you guys. But if bacteria and viruses come in, then like, wait a second. But bacteria and viruses are smart, right? They'll, they'll find maybe uh, 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 illegal ID, a fake ID, and they'll kind of disguise themselves as someone else, someone that's older. And then they'll try to sneak into the club and same thing. So bacteria and viruses, they like to sneak into the cells and cause damage. So hopefully that uh, little analogy helped you. I have more of those. Hopefully throughout the uh, the semester I can teach you. Again, it's, it's more than just pure memorization. I want you to really visualize this stuff. Okay, here's the cytoplasm, cytoskeleton, organelles. We'll talk about organelles, inclusions, and cytosol. The nucleus is the brain of the cell. It's an organelle containing a nucleoplasm, but the nucleus basically tells what the cell what to do. There are certain cells that don't have a nucleus um, due to the shape. Red blood cells uh, do not have a nucleus. Okay. So here's what a generalized cell looks like. Here's the nucleus in the middle. It has nuclear pores, chromatin, nuclear envelope to protect it. The nucleus, which is the brain, and the nucleolus, which makes ribosomes. So you're thinking, well, what are ribosomes? So guess what? Ribosomes make proteins. And proteins are needed to carry out everyday functions. So here's the little plasma membrane. Here's the Golgi vesicle, which is an organelle that I like to correlate that to the UPS of the cell. So what does UPS do? It ships packages and transports. So the Golgi vesicles or the Golgi apparatus helps ship package and transport molecules or proteins throughout the cell inside and out. You have a rough endoplasmic reticulum which is surrounded by ribosomes. Then you have a smooth endoplasmic reticulum that doesn't have ribosomes on the outside. Since the rough endoplasmic reticulum is surrounded by ribosomes, it plays a key role in protein synthesis. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum, it doesn't have the ribosomes, but it plays a key role in lipid synthesis, lipid meaning fat. But the smooth endoplasmic reticulum also does detoxification. So we like the smooth endoplasmic because it helps detox alcohol, drugs, etc. So if you had a late night parting, your smooth endoplasmic reticulum is going to work overtime. But it also detoxes the cell itself. You have peroxisomes, microtubule lysosomes are like little Pac-Man. Remember Pac-Man, the old school Atari game? Well, basically it goes in here and chomps off cellular debris or anything that should be that. So they clean up the cell. And then you have mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. You have these centromes, centrioles, which are two, that helps in mitosis. So you need these to start mitosis. Okay, and you have these secretory vesicles, which will take out through endocytosis or and just take out some stuff that is, doesn't belong in here. Say, okay, we're done with you, so I'll engulf it and then spit it out here. Or you can bring in other particles from the outside and say, okay, come on in here and I'll engulf it and bring it in here. So it can either spit it out or bring it back in. Now I'll start with one of the key components to the cell is the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. That's the boundary of the cell. Remember I said that he acts like the bouncer. The membrane is full of lipids which are fats. It has a phospholipid bilayer which is about 75 percent. Now remember there's the hydrophilic side which is attracted to water and the hydrophobic side which are the tails that repel water. Cholesterol there's a, there's a little bit of cholesterol on the cell membrane, and we like that cholesterol, 20%, because it, it contributes to the fluidity of the membrane. Okay, so fluidity is it, how rigid is it? Is it So depending on how much cholesterol, it can make the plasma membrane really rigid or really soft. It just depends. Okay, and then glycolipids make up about 
5%, and they contribute to the glycocalyx. And what does the glycocalyx do? Well, it plays a very important role. So the glycocalyx is important in cell recognition, but bacteria use glycocalyx quite a bit to protect themselves from the immune system. So they can either have a thick glycocalyx and really protect themselves from the phagocytes that are in your immune system. So bacteria, very, very important role to have glycocalyx in here. Okay. Then you have some membrane proteins, which are integral transmembrane proteins. They pass through the membrane. Then you have glycoproteins and you have peripheral proteins that adhere to either face of the membrane. And what these proteins do will help larger structures go in and out of the plasma membrane. Here is that phospholipid bilayer that I was showing you. Phospholipid molecule consists of a polar phosphate head, which is hydrophilic, and a non-polar lipid tail, which is hydrophobic. Hydrophobic meaning uh, uh, does not like water. Hydrophilic means loves water. So these are attracted to the outer surface of the cell membrane and then inside near the cytoplasm. The tails are on the opposite side there. Unsaturated fatty acids results in kinks in hydrophobic tails. Again, this is more a uh, little physiology. I just want you to understand that the cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer and this is the component of it and that should be okay. Here's some fun facts before you get too bored listening to phospholipid and hydrophobic. <laughs> the colder the room you sleep in, guess what? The better chances that you'll have a bad dream. Crazy, right? It's entirely clear. It isn't entirely clear to scientists why this is the case. But if you are opposed to having nightmares, you may want to keep yourself a little toastier at night. A couple extra blankets. They do have this uh, kind of weighted blankets that have become really popular. Have you seen those where you kind of put them on and uh, they say that it helps you sleep better. But for kids that have autism or neurological disorders, the the weight of the blanket really calms them down. It's kind of like if you were to hold your child, right? The, the, just by holding your child, the child will calm down. So the weight of these blankets called weighted blankets really calm them down. Uh, <clears throat> tears and mucus contain an enzyme, which is a lysozyme that breaks down the cell wall of many bacteria. Remember I was telling you about Purell? Uh, that will help break down the cell wall of many bacteria as well. So this is to your advantage to have tears and mucus as the mucus that lines your nose and throat, as well as the tears that wet your eyes are helping to prevent bacteria from infecting those areas and making you sick. So crying is not a bad thing. Now the phospholipid bilayer, going back to that, <laughs> consists of two adjacent sheets of phospholipids arranged tail to tail. So here's the little tails which are hydrophobic, okay, they don't like the water. And then you have the heads which are hydrophilic which they like the water. So extracellular meaning outside the cell and then intracellular where the cytoplasm is, is right here. And this is that phospholipid bilayer. You'll have a little bit of cholesterol in here and that will uh, affect how rigid this plasma membrane or cell membrane would be. Here's the cell membrane, a little bit more detail. There's the little cholesterol that I was telling you. Here's channel proteins. Here's the phospholipid bilayer. Here's the integral membrane protein. So again, what these proteins do is they can help certain things come in and out or they have their own function. Then you have a glycolipid, lipid with carbohydrate, and a glycoprotein protein with a carbohydrate attached right here. Okay. The cell membrane of the cell is a phospholipid bilayer containing many different molecular components, including proteins and cholesterol, some with carbohydrate groups attached. And carbs give us energy, right? All right, so imagine the cell membrane as a bouncer at the club. Here's the security. You say, hey, I'm coming up on the cell and says certain things can go in free, right? So certain things like sodium, potassium, um, well, might require a little bit of assistance. Glucose, sodium. So this is like having a cover, cover charge for 10 bucks, right? So, okay, you can come in, but you got to pay a little bit. You need some assistance. Basically, water can go in and out of the cell. It doesn't need anything. So that's like ladies or anyone before 10 p.m., right? You don't have to pay cover. We, all the clubs, they said, oh, come on in. 
Okay, so that's like water. Water has no, it just can go in and out, in and out, no big deal. Larger molecules such as glucose, sodium, potassium, they're, they can go in and out of the cell, but they need to require a little bit of assistance. They're like paying a little bit of a cover charge. Okay, some molecules require special receptors. That's like the VIP entrance, right? So there are certain molecules that are larger that require some special receptors to bind. And those are those integral proteins can play a role in that. Some molecules, though, we need to block out. Those are like viruses and bacteria. Those are like the shady peeps with hats and tank tops, right? Trying to, they're wearing shorts and tank tops trying to get in the club and the bouncer says, all right, get out of here. So that's like viruses and bacteria. But then what happens is these shady peeps with hats and tank tops, they'll go and borrow a shirt or borrow and try to sneak their way in to the cell, right? Or to the club. And that's what these viruses and bacteria do. They kind of, what do they do? They kind of recognize or they try to hide themselves and then they kind of flirt their way into the club or the cell membrane. So they're, they're very sneaky, especially viruses. Uh, they actually go into the nucleus and they can reproduce in there and that's why it's very difficult to uh, kill. When we do the immune system, we'll talk about all sorts of things. So we'll talk about T cells, B cells, lymphocytes, uh, phagocytes, macrophages, all that good stuff. Now, let's talk about how these molecules go inside and outside the cell, because that's very important. Simple diffusion across the cell membrane. So this is simple diffusion. Basically, the structure of the lipid bilayer allows only small nonpolar substances such as oxygen, carbon dioxide to pass through the cell membrane down their concentration gradient by simple diffusion. Meaning, if you have a high concentration here, well, there's not too many here well it's going to go from a area of high concentration to low concentration that's called diffusion so anytime a molecule passes through from one area to another from high concentration to low concentration that's called diffusion now osmosis is the diffusion of just water so if there's a high concentration of water here and no concentration of water here as it goes from high to low it's actually called osmosis Okay. Facilitated diffusion is, remember when those channel proteins that are in the plasma membrane? Well, the facilitated diffusion of substances crossing the cell membrane takes place with the help of proteins, such as the channel proteins and carrier proteins. Channel proteins are less selective than carrier proteins and usually mildly discriminate between their cargo based on size and cargo. Okay. So channel proteins are less selective, so maybe a bacteria or virus may target the channel protein. But the carrier proteins are more selective, often allowing only one particular type of molecule to cross and say, okay, do you have the secret code? So this, uh, they might let you in the back door if they have the secret code. Okay, so that's carrier proteins. So I'm hoping these little analogies uh, will help you because it's like all this stuff can be foreign, especially if this is the first time you're going back to school. So uh, relating it to something that's uh, everyday life may help. Some of you say, oh, Patel, nobody goes to the club anymore. Your, your analogies are antiquated. Okay, well, I saw. I'm sorry. I'll try to be a little bit more hip uh, later on in the lecture. <laughs> All right. Osmosis. Remember I mentioned that? Here's a semi-permeable membrane. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. So remember that definition. Osmosis is the diffusion of water through a semi-permeable membrane down a concentration gradient. Concentration gradient meaning high concentration to low concentration. If a membrane is permeable to water, though not a solute, solute would be salt, wa uh, sugar, water will equalize its own concentration by diffusing to the side of lower water concentration and thus the side of the higher solute concentration. So if in the beaker on the left, the solution on the right side of the membrane is hypertonic. We'll talk about hypertonic versus hypotonic versus isotonic. Now here's something here. People use the terminology wrong. So why doesn't osmosis work like this? Remember, <clears throat> I told you, osmosis is the diffusion of water. So really it should say, why doesn't diffusion work like this? But people say, but that'd be nice, right? <clears throat> Put your books here, put my notes there, 
just uh, and all of a sudden you just take a little nap and it goes from high concentration to low concentration <laughs> uh, but our goal is to become isotonic so the book and your brain knowledge is equal there you go another one of Patel's analogies <laughs> here's a example of isotonic hypotonic and hypertonic okay a hypertonic solution has a solute concentration higher than another solution a isotonic solution has a solute concentrate equal to another solution and a hypotonic solution has a solute concentration lower than another solution so what happens is if you drink too much water right there's a, such a thing as drinking too much water we'll talk about how much water you should drink but what happens is if too much fluid gets into the cells then you can burst what happens if you don't have enough water and then what happens is all the cells here can become dehydrated and pretty much shrivel and die off so too much water is not good too little water is not good we want a balance just like life we need a balance of studying having fun eating drinking whatever the case uh, needs to be but it shouldn't just be go gung-ho study 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 you need a break every once in a while speaking of break let's take a little break here <laughs> 